You and Art Monk are on my list. This is football. I'm Kevin Clark. Dominique Foxworth joins very soon for probably the best interview we've done, best long form interview we've done here on this show in its young history. 45, 50 minutes of uncut Dominique. Uh, awesome. Uh, we got into modern defense, why defenses have hit their stride so far this year, some of the structural differences in defenses now. A little bit about the Dolphins. I mean, we, we touched on everything. Um, got into an argument about whether or not. He was a better football player or broadcaster. Spoiler alert, I think Dominique is the best person talking about football on television who's played football. Um, but we get into it because he thinks he's a better player because he made the NFL. I don't know. You decide. Um, very quickly, I want to talk about the Jets here. I have two thoughts. Number one, Aaron Rodgers is not coming back. Number two, actually, I have three thoughts. Number two thought is... The Rodgers conversation does a disservice to what this team is actually doing, which is they are playing good enough defense, and we talked about this in the Dominique segment, to legitimately, in an AFC that is weaker than we think, make the playoffs. They can make the playoffs. They're not, I'm not, I think the Browns are going to make the playoffs because of the defense. I think the Jets can make the playoffs because of the defense. That makes, and this is thought number three, the decision to double down and triple down on Zach Wilson look even worse because if they just had average quarterback play, and even though they've gotten that maybe half the time the last few weeks, even if they had average, above average quarterback play, um, they would win nine, ten games, enough to win, you know, to, to get a wild card spot. And that's what they should be chasing after Aaron Rodgers goes down 40 seconds into the season. Um, but I think the focus on whether or not Rodgers can return, and I know why it's happening, and, and we've talked about it, why he's doing it, why the Jets are hyping that up, all that stuff. It's great. Why the media is hyping it up. Good for them. But it does a disservice, and it distracts from what this Jets team is, which is a legitimate, dominant front seven with some of the best players in football, with Bryce Huff, who is rushing the passer statistically at a better clip than anybody in football over the past two seasons. Um, we know about their investments there and 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 the studs. I mean, you would talk about Celtics Gardner didn't even play on Sunday, and they were still able to get after Jalen Hurts over 40% of the time. So this Jets team is legit. They're the type of team, and I talked about this in the open or the second segment on uh, on Sunday, the type of team nobody wants to see in January. I know that's always a cliche, but like it's real when you're the type of team that can wreck a quarterback and wreck a season. So uh, my one note, I know it's not going to happen. Talk less about Rogers, talk more about the Jets team that's on the field and can win any single Sunday. All right, here's Dominic. Tickets to the game, merch, meals at iconic restaurants, stays at Caesars Palace. All this can be yours when you bet with Caesars Sportsbook. Win or lose, every bet earns reward credits which you can redeem across the empire. Now, if you haven't started yet, use the code Omaha full and then place your first bet up to $1,250. If you win, great. You keep those winnings. But if you lose, you get your stake back as a bonus bet. All right. Dominique Foxworth, former NFL star turned TV star. What are you better at TV or football? <sighs> um, let's see. Well, I think probably football. If you take into um, consideration the number of professional football players and the number of people on TV. I think I was probably in a more elite class of professional football players than I am uh, TV people. What do you think? I disagree because I think, first of all, uh, I think you're one of the best people at talking football. And oh, I, gosh. I, I, I don't offend you. I don't offend you. No, 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 no. I don't offend you. Oh. You were not one of the best people playing defensive back in the early 2010s and late 2000s that's just categorically false like uh i was a starting quarterback in nfl there's only 64 of them how many people are on get up well get up is not the pinnacle of television i'm thinking of all of people oh, okay on television. all right and what it, i mean i i disagree what are you best at 
Um, I'm a, well, it's, it's funny is that I actually think I am a, a very good writer and mm. I actually don't write. Uh, I don't, no one will pay, no one has currently yeah. paid me to write because yeah. I haven't asked. I haven't yeah. asked anybody to pay me to write in, in uh, well, I six mean, weeks. As unfortunate as it is, the um, writing just doesn't make that much money. So how does it make you feel? <laughs> I've, noticed, I've, no, I've noticed that's why, I, that's why I'm yeah. talking to a microphone right now. How does it make you feel that I'm better than you at everything? Uh, I mean, well, I book you on the shows, oh. and then I am, I bask in, in the reflected glory here, and nobody notices that I'm bad at anything. You're not bad. You're great. It's just I happen to be better than you at all the things that well, no, are see, I have done. Uh, but I have a competitive advantage because I'm a really good writer. But again, I don't do that anymore. I don't do that anymore. You uh-huh. wrote a piece uh, you a couple years ago about the... Uh, about modern defense. I remember it was very good. And it maybe is evidence that you're better at writing than me. But we're not going to find out because neither of us write. Anymore, <laughs> there's no money in it. Yep. Well, I mean, there's money in yep. screenwriting. Yeah, which you also do. So there you go. Um, <laughs> I will say, uh, that to actually put, I actually do think you're one of the best people talking about football. I don't think within the context of being a professional, I thought you were one of the best defensive backs. But the beauty is, you take that, experience and you put that into how good you are at tv and you have tv magic and you make get up the pinnacle of tv which i feel like is you know earlier you took a shot at get up by saying it wasn't the pinnacle of tv what is meet the press 60 minutes um well ozzy newsome would disagree with you on the first point and he knows a thing or two about um, (laughs) evaluating evaluating talent and hmm, the pinnacle of tv i mean i don't know it's like uh uh, succession. I guess I don't know. Most succession. recent, uh, maybe. So that. if you had if you had a guest spot on Succession, you'd be like, "This is better than Get Up." Um, yeah. I, if I I don't know about a guest spot. It depends. Like if I was a recurring oh, character, did, did, yeah, okay. I got or you. yeah, I would be like, yeah, like now a board I'm, member. If yeah. you were one of those board members who had to vote at the end, or even no like spoilers. like Sinai Lathan's character, or she was like a lawyer yeah. that popped in for a few episodes, like. I mean, you can't have too All many right. black well, people. Well, it's off the air, so often. we can't. Re- <laughs> uh, we can't really. Uh, we can't really get that going because it's. I don't off know the what air. else. Is, well, theory, there's the nothing on TV session. right now. What is until because baseball? Of, the it's, it goes full circle because sports? no, it's not. It's because nobody respects writers. It's why nothing's on TV oh, right, right now. Right, yeah, right, right, so right, right. Whenever uh, I don't know what's the pinnacle. What's your favorite TV show of all time? Like we're, I feel like we're past the age where it's, it's like golden. Oh wait, wait, can I throw a theory? Golden I Girls. Remember. Golden Girls is a great gonna, show. Golden Girls. Gonna is, say, thank you for. I was gonna being say gold, I was gonna say golden. Golden era Simpsons. Golden age, golden age uh, era Simpsons. Good stuff. Um, were you gonna say we're past the age of us like getting into new stuff? No, 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 no. I, I, that, oh, okay. That might be true also, but I feel like we're past the age where you can develop new favorites. Like I feel yeah, like so, there's like we're already formed in a point where you're like, oh, that's my, that's my thing right there. Whereas now yeah, 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 it's yeah. kind of weird to be like 40 and be like, Hey, yeah. I got a new thing. Yeah. Um, I'd say that I, a couple things about that. Number one, I have this theory that every NFL head coach stops developing any knowledge of the outside world. <laughs> as soon as they become a coordinator, <laughs> That's like their last memory. So you'll always, it'll always be like, like Kyle Shanahan naming his kid uh, after a Lil Wayne song, right? <laughs> like that's a great, like Kyle mm-hmm. Shanahan is going, yeah. is never going to, has no idea who Ice Spice is. Ugh. He will never develop any sort of pop culture memory or data bank, uh, database going forward ever again. But he loves Lil Wayne and will probably just listen to him until the day he dies. Like the, I think if you are in a high pressure environment, the moment that you, there's a threshold you cross in which you're like, I can no longer watch television. We're not at that because we have easier jobs than those guys, um, although you've been inside of it. But I'm just saying that there's a, there's a threshold, especially people in football, where there is just no new information coming into the brand that's not football. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair. And I think that's like probably not just football coaches. So it might happen to football coaches more aggressively because they're, you're right. They don't know about pop culture like general things and i think also some of them play it up because they want to appear yeah more football-y guy like i mean bill belichick knows what snap face is or insta face whatever he called it back in the day like he knows what social media is the best one of that was when he got an award from mit sloan this mit sloan conference mm-hmm. um and then like a couple months later he wanted 
so little to do with analytics that he called it the Northeastern Conference or whatever. He literally just got the school wrong just to take a shot at analytics, even though he's the most analytics guy. I mean, not anymore, but like for like a decade, he was Mr. Analytics, but he wanted us off the scent. So it was always snap face and book chat and all of this stuff. And then he, he just wants so badly you, he like gives off an image that he doesn't care about his image, but he is very, very deliberate about cultivating this image of dingy uh, football basement dweller who doesn't care about anything but football. Now that we're coming to the end of the Belichick era. Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Let's cool it. Let's cool it. Cool it. Now that we are in the late it? stages of the Belichick era. Late stage Belichick. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you have a favorite memory about going up against Belichick? Did you have? Did you I like, do? Oh, ooh, ooh. yeah. It's um. So my rookie year, I started uh, a bunch of games as a third round pick across from Champ Bailey. We were thirteen and three. Um, play for the Denver Broncos. More evidence against your point, where you continue to insult me about my abilities at cornerback. We had a lot what, of success. I, before you launch into this, before you Hold launch on. into this, I was looking at Rock Bottom Theater. Like I was like, oh, what's the worst team who was on? You were only on good teams. Some good. All right. So, yeah, I've never um, – the last time I was on a losing team – oh, actually, my, my senior year in college, I think we only won five mm. games. And my sophomore year Could've in more. high Could've school – to help out the team. You're right. I was too yeah. focused on making the, the jump. My <laughs> sophomore year in high school, we only won one game and followed that by mm. winning eight games next season. But anyway, okay. the Belichick story. Um, we – because we were good at corner – we did zero blitzes the entire season. That was our strategy. Mm-hmm. We had trouble getting pressure with four, so we would do zero blitzes. We had this blitz bluff package where we'd show, line up on third downs. Uh, it would look like punt rush with a straight line across the line of scrimmage with the exception of like the cornerbacks and anyone in coverage receivers were off the line. No safety. We'd either send everybody and play zero or um, – drop out the three guys who were high would drop into cover three and play cover three. It was baffling people all season long. Um, and Mike Shanahan was manufacturing offense with uh, Jake Plummer and we were really mm-hmm. good. So 13 and three, we were, uh, we played the Patriots. We had a bye. we had the Patriots, a division round of playoffs and Belichick was the only person or the, that team figured out how to beat us by motioning the slot receiver across. And so whoever was covering the slot receiver would run with them. And then this guy, the the man who, the slot receiver, would block the end man on line of scrimmage. So they would get a two for one in that situation where he was blocking and we were covering him. So they would have enough time to run uh, more advanced routes. It didn't work. We beat them because <laughs> they did not have uh, a player that was capable of blocking that end man. But what it did mm. do was set us up. We had a home game against the Steelers to get to the Super Bowl. The Steelers did the exact same thing, but they're the mm. one team in football who had mm. Heinz Ward, yep. who was a slot receiver who was capable of being a tackle because he was that ferocious a player. And we lost to the Steelers, which is a weird uh, story, but we lost to the Steelers because of Belichick's. I'm assuming that they saw what Belichick was doing and was like, hey, that works. We have a guy who can actually do it. <laughs> <laughs> and they stole wow. Belichick's strategy and beat us. You guys didn't make the Super Bowl because Belichick came up with a strategy that he himself could not run, but Heinz Ward could. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, and so the point in that uh, that offense that or that um, strategy that yeah. we were doing was in zero coverage, it simplified things for us. It's like, all right, they have to throw it quick or they have to throw a go. So I'd read three-step, and if it wasn't three-step, I was pretty fast, so I'd race people down the field, and I was fine. So then when they did this blocking thing, they then had the normal amount of time. So that opened up everything else in the offense that they wanted without us having a safety. So they gave me specifically and our team in general. We had trouble scoring because that Steelers defense was good. Gave us the blues, and we got our ass kicked. And I dropped an interception in the first quarter that um, I don't Mm. think about every day of my life. Huh, a little more ammo for for me on that one. Yeah. Um, all right. Great so coverage and man coverage, though. I mean, I had it covered, but mm. I dropped it. That's why I played yeah. quarterback well, and receivers. Yeah, yeah. Bunch of different. Bunch all different right. And now I shared a story. I shared a story with you. I also host a podcast, so like I'm comfortable with asking you questions yeah. too. So my question for you is, what's your reason? Who was the coach that kept you from getting to your Super Bowl? 
Well, um, I've tried unsuccessfully mm-hmm. to connect with Bill Belichick. Um, <laughs> and un- un- unsuccessfully is an understatement. And I tried so hard to impress him. And I, I this is like probably going to people this probably doesn't track my personality but i'm a pathetically hard worker and so if i'm going to meet with someone i do so much legwork on the front end that i'm so prepared like if i'm gonna meet with andy reed i will do i will scour every single interview he's ever done to just make sure that he, i don't have him repeat stuff or or i do you know hey there's a thread he never uh, closed the loop on let's talk about that so before i was like a couple days before i knew i was going to be in the vicinity of belichick um I read his father's scouting book. I read um, the um, like the Michael Holly wrote three books about basically his his tree, coaching tree, GMing tree, and and some of the other stuff. And I, I read as much as I could about that. I sat I sat at a Chili's in West Palm Beach reading these books for like two hours. Mm. Um, I didn't finish all the books. I just remember, vividly remember being at a Chili's and reading the Michael Holly books. Um, and so as one does. Mm. And so I saw him. And I wanted to ask him a question because Rich McKay, who I was probably uh, one of your bosses with, with the 2008 Atlanta Falcons, had said something about how the passing boom since 2012, the passing boom uh, was actually historically in line with some of the 1950 stats, 1960 stats, and that actually like the 70s, 80s, and 90s were the ones that were out of step. And he was doing that just to justify how wild the rules had gotten or whatever. And so I see him at the coach's breakfast and I'm like, all right, here we go. Here comes my lifelong friendship with Bill Belichick. Wow. The payoff and, uh, on this is going to be amazing. I can tell. And uh, he said, um, I asked him about that. And I said, hey, can you just speak to what what Rich said and whether or not you think the passing boom and the stats are in line, out of line? And he just looks at me and says, yeah, I don't know uh, what Rich is talking about. <laughs> and then. And then just Aww. stops looking at me. So, and so then, so then I was like, right, I'm going to wait him out. I'm going to wait him out. And so then, uh, he starts walking the elevator a little bit after the coaching thing. And I, uh, I walk with him the whole time and I'm just trying to like say anything. I mean, I'm talking about 45 seconds. Just say anything. That's like, just going to get him to remember me. Cause I'm 25, whatever I am at that point. Um, after you turn 30, all, all years are fake, but, um, uh, and then, um, I'm just, I go to the elevator and I almost, I don't remember if I did or not. Like, I feel like I've probably implanted this memory. I feel like I may have done like the blocking the elevator for five seconds thing just to say my name again, whatever. And I turn around and Scott Pioli and Thomas Dimitrov are standing there and they are uproar. And they both know me at this point. They're yeah. both, they're both uproariously laughing at me. <laughs> Oh. And like they like in a fun way. And I think Pioli, I think the way Pioli put it was, cause like, it was wa- like watching a, like a, a kid in a rodeo, like just trying to stay on the bull, <laughs> just trying to stay on the bull. And uh, not Dimitrov was, was in Atlanta also. I feel so sad. Yeah. You, you're like, I mean, I feel like you sound like, like a pick me girl is like what they would, the kids would call that where you're like, Hey, you say whatever you can to get the, yeah. the boys to think you're cool. I'm sorry. The yeah. boys didn't think you were cool. I think you're cool though. Well, no. Well, Dimitrov and Pioli did think I was cool. No, not, see, you don't, you don't. You don't understand <laughs> what laughing at you means. <laughs> no, it was a Bill specific thing. I like both okay, those guys. Okay. They like me. Yes, they do now. I'm sure, but at the time, they were like, "Who's this pathetic loser that thought?" That- oh yeah, no, no, definitely, definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that's not. That's the opposite of cool. I don't know if you know this or not. I don't know how long you you felt cool, but as someone who's been cool <laughs> for a long time, I can tell you that when people are laughing at you. And believe you to be pathetic and desperate, and then you're cool. But you're cool now. Uh, I will say I am pathetic and desperate, but I am cool. You're not pathetic and I'm, desperate anymore. Um, the jury's still out. I would say. <laughs> hey, um, let's so let's go to the actual thing. We're in minute fifteen of this podcast. The thing I actually asked you to prep for. So I didn't prep, by the way. My, my <laughs> the only prep for get up the pinnacle of television. Exactly. Um, I have a new theory that defense is back okay. because yards per completion down as much as it has ever been since the merger um, red zone efficiency worse than it's ever been number of touchdowns way down, obviously with red zone efficiency that that goes hand in hand, 60% of unders are hitting this year, uh, which has not happened in the two thousands. Um, 
And I know we can never have like steel curtain era type stuff. We can never have a uh, Baltimore bullies type of stuff. But when I look at the Browns having the third best yardage performance by a defense through five games in 50 years, 52 first downs, nobody who's played five games has given up uh, within 40 of that. The Bucks have given up, I think, 93 first downs. Um, the Jets have turned Allen, Mahomes, and Hurts, the top three vote getters and MVP last year, into, if you combine them, a quarterback with a 61 rating against anybody else, they have a 101 rating. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask a bunch of questions within this particular genre, but I'll start here. Um, is this an anomaly, and will it's the pendulum sp- swing back quicker than we think quicker than I think so you say that you have a theory and I I mean I don't know if you need to prove that in some way I guess a a theory is not a law so you don't have to prove it but I have a hard time and I did I was joking about not doing any research the reason why I said I didn't do any research is because I couldn't come to a conclusion like I want to be able to give you the explanation that takes your theory from theory to like proof and that's the hard thing is there's no simple explanation for what has happened which six weeks in the disparity and what we're accustomed to as far as numbers are concerned is enough time and enough of a gap in the efficiency and the points and the yards there's enough for me to say that this is not randomness because my first instinct is to think over the course of the last I don't know 15 20 years of football offense has been trending upward. Like it's not a straight line. There's like kind of like the stock market. There are ups and downs, but over the course of the long stretch, it's been going upward. And all numbers have gone upward. Efficiencies on offense has gone upward. Pass has gone upward. Points has gone upward. Quarterback play has gone up. All that is going up. And my thought is when I first hear this, like, eh, relax. It's just the beginning of one season. We did this, was it last year or a couple of years ago when we had the foolish take that drove me crazy that, hey, Defenses are now using two safeties deep. <laughs> and and people are really trotting this shit out. Like, hey, this is what's stifling Patrick Mahomes and uh and I think it was Joe Burrow. This is the two safeties yeah. deep. And I was just like, you know what? Cover two is the second coverage <laughs> ever created in the history of football. I'm pretty sure that Patrick Mahomes and Joe Burrow are all right with the second coverage. It's not yeah. some new coverage. So I think. Yes, it's real. It's hard for me to feel all that confident in in it staying because I don't know why. And maybe it's well. I, the thing is, you could look at a bunch of numbers. So offensive line play is is down, and I think the pressure yes. on quarterbacks has something to do with it. And people pre- presented the argument to me because they like to present this argument to me because I was president of the union and negotiated for um, less hitting in practice. They say, well, it's because they don't get to hit in practice anymore. Like, okay, well, you know what? That rule has been changed since I was president of the union, which was a decade or more ago. So, like, it's a, it's weird that it just took this long to to happen. And maybe it's health of the offensive line. Anyway, I'm rambling on your show, but the point well, is – Well, it's also the, the, college, the college game, too, is producing yeah. worse offensive linemen, right. and they can still hit in practice. Right. So the point is uh, I – think it's real but I don't think it's sustainable because I don't and I I guess yeah I don't know why it's happening I I can't explain the the single reason why it doesn't and I watch a lot of football I don't see like some new scheme like it's not like someone just invented the bear or the 46 or the 3 4 <laughs> you know what I mean it's not that we've just invented some new scheme that no one can do anything with the one thing that does feel relatively new and it's not brand new but in the last I don't know, eight to nine years, it feels like the quality of pass rushers has Mm, increased. And I remember thinking like there's one or two guys that are in the league that seem unblockable. It now feels like there's like eight to 12 that are like, you better double team him. You better chip him or, or he's going to destroy your offensive day. So, I have a couple questions off of that. Number one, the rise of like the unblockable pass rusher to me always felt like it was inevitable only because if you're like six, seven, there's a whole bunch of guys who play basketball and then they like go to DePaul and they're like a four star and then they make like $90,000 
playing in like the Turkish second division after that. Do you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. I was always like, why don't we, why don't you guys just gain 75 pounds and just yeah, start easy. playing for Ohio state? Like this is like, I always felt like that type of body. Um, if you, if, if my kid by the grace of God grows up to be like six, seven and he's like, I want to hoop. I'm like, I don't, I don't think that's let's get you let's get you some corn and let's get you in in, in Iowa's defense. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> what? Nothing. It's Iowa's gonna defense. It's gonna Iowa's defense is great. No, I mean it's a it's the perfect defense to choose. That's all. I just want him to be a uh, uber athletic, like hand in the dirt or outside linebacker. Um, and Phil Parker is ready ready to, to mold him. Is all I'm saying. Um, and so I, I guess the question is like, can you, is, is this why, is it like sports efficiency that where there's all these unblockable Uber athletes, are we better at uh, identifying them? Are that like, I, I don't know if there's a, a freakonomics answer here, but like, it just seems like, and I would say also say freakish tight ends on the, on the other side of the ball. Like it just yeah. feels like a bunch of basketball players are now becoming Uber athletes in football. I remember, um, was it, it was the beginning of last season where I, I kind of, as again, we don't write anymore, so I didn't write it, but it would have been a piece I wrote if I if I wrote, and I just shopped it around the podcast circuit. But talking about how corners today, <laughs> yeah, that uh, the we're in the golden age of cornerbacks, and the argument that I made was not that these cornerbacks are like so much better than we were or the cornerbacks of yesteryear, but it was that the rules of the game have been modified. And they were constantly tweaking them like the last, I don't know, for not not recently, but for the time when I was in the league and and prior to that, they were tweaking the rules. And it was like the Belichick uh, defense was too aggressive downfield. They changed that. Then they took more pressure off of the quarterbacks. They protected quarterbacks. And they got tighter on downfield pass interference. And so I remember being in the league and feeling like, the game was different than the one I grew up playing. And my theory was these are kids who grew up playing modern football. And I, Mm -hmm. I've seen them be able to play the back shoulder fade in a way that we just kind of had to choose. Like either I'm going to guard the back shoulder, I'm going to go upfield. Whereas they kind of do this side saddle technique. So anyway, long story short, I think that could be an argument also is that, we're finally getting to the point where the value of the pass rusher is so high and the, the value of the cornerback is so high and the game has been consistent long enough that you are getting guys who are born to play defense in this way and have developed to play defense in this league. And they have caught up to uh, the way that the game is being played now and the type of athletes like you mentioned yeah so you're six three to six seven you have a slim chance of going to the nba but if you can get yourself up to 275 you have a high ass chance of getting college paid for and getting to the nfl and you're more likely to find somebody like uh miles garrett who great basketball player nba great basketball player no nfl quality maybe the best player in all of football on defense the modern defense thing is really fascinating to me because I remember at the beginning of the passing when we talked to Andrew Lux, high school coach. Now it's not a name drop. I, it was really easy to get him on the phone. Um, and he was basically just like, name think drop. about it was that El, Andrew Lux, I think his name's Elliot something. Elliot, I don't remember. Elliot Allen. Um, and so he's in Texas. Talk about the Texas quarterback. And he was saying, think about all the great athletes who came to come from Texas now, right? Including Miles Garrett. But he was like, think about the seven on seven circuit. What is it? It's quarterbacks throwing against tight man-to-man coverage over and over and over again for nine months out of the year. And then the other three months, they actually play high school football and they have pads on. Yeah. So it's a lot of fast guys. It's a lot of good route runners. I mean, you got your Mike Evans of the world where it's just like, he's just running go routes and, and whatever for his entire life until he gets to te- Texas A&M. Um, like it just feels like that generation, which came of age after the passing boom, it's seven on sevens. It's private workouts. We don't even talk about that stuff. Going to Arizona and being able to do that stuff and and working out together, I, you know, best on best for for months out of the year. It just feels like this is this is modern football in its final form with some of these athletes. Yeah, I, I think you just rephrased the similar thing and inc- included everyone else, but I don't know why. 
the thing that I have hard time understanding is why it has not been as gradual. If we're to accept that this is a new normal, why does it feel like it happened in a flash? Like this season is when it's happening. That feels like something that like we would see trends change. And maybe it and maybe we maybe this is just the tipping point and we'll start to see it kind of change slowly over the course of time, but mm, they'll probably change the rules before it gets there because they hate defense. I agree, the yes. So they'll nerf this somehow. But I, I think mm. that part of it is that you're young. Gamer terms, nerf it. I like that. No, no, that's from Formula One. Oh, that's a nerf. That's a gamer yeah, term. They nerf. They nerf cars. Nah, that's a gamer term. They nerf that cars. Formula One stole. <laughs> they they nerf uh, weapons in Call of Duty. Let me tell you something. You're trying to get the Europeans to fight the gamers, and I'm staying out of it because I'm neither <laughs> of those things. Um, two two people's asses, I would have no problem whooping. <laughs> gamers and Europeans. What about FIFA Twitch guys? Mm. That's one and the same. Uh, hey, um, America, damn it. So, so um. It's it's interesting, but like part of it is that like I saw a stat from Jalen Hurts yesterday, and I, I bet every quarterback is like this, but except probably Mahomes. But M- Hurts is three and seven when he's pressured over forty percent of the time, twenty five and five when he's not. And I I you say the rules thing or whatever, but it's like man, if you're getting pressure forty percent of the time like the Jets did on Sunday, you're just gonna win. And like even Hurts when it, it felt like he was. He was rushing throws. He was late on throws. He was uncomfortable. He was seeing ghosts. I know that like Sam Darnold went went viral a couple of years ago for saying he sees ghosts. Like any quarterback who gets the crap knocked out of him for 58 minutes and 59th minute is going to to see ghosts. Um, they don't want to get hit anymore. And so it just seems like if you can get a nasty pass rush and a na- nasty front seven, like they just didn't have their top two cornerbacks. If you can just get that, even with the Browns the other day, like Dalvin Tomlinson coming through the middle and, you know, Miles Garrett didn't even have to make the play. Like it just seems like if you've got a nasty front seven, everything else can work itself out afterwards. Yeah. Cornerbacks don't matter, nor do safeties. Uh, you're right. I would push back on one thing. That's true. I think having the broad conversation is difficult for me to zero in on specific situations, but I have a hard time accepting what you said about the Eagles game because I actually watched and rewatched that game, and it's a specific game. And the front seven matters. The pressure on Hurts matters. But honestly, the pressure on Hurts, at least to me, it felt like less – the less because the offensive line was getting your ass whooped, but more because Jalen Hurts likes to hold onto the ball and he's right. accustomed to that offensive line being incredible. So right. that is not having a, a great front seven, not to say that they don't, they certainly do. And I would also say that, and I'm not sure that the stats would back this up, but I, I feel like they could, that from my eye test, the Eagles didn't get dominated. They didn't have a problem moving the ball. They didn't have a problem finding open people. There were, turnovers there was that goddard interception that was fluky as hell there was a fumble there was the uh the hit that caused an interception which yeah you can give that to the defense there were two drop passes from uh from smith like it felt like that did not feel like an example of the jets defense being dominant as much as it felt like an example of the jets being a very good defense and opportunistic defense but the eagles not converting in the red zone and making key mistakes. And then there's that last interception at the end of the game, which, like, they still would have won if they would have just punted it on third down to Zach Wilson and dared him to lead them on a two-minute drive. Hey, you're a better TV guy than cornerback, just so you know. Because that was, that was phenomenal. Does that upset you? This isn't on TV. I'm a better, I mean, it's, it could be on YouTube. It's on the ESPN NFL uh, YouTube page. Uh-uh. It's, can, I can, there's a TV right behind this computer, and I can put it on there tomorrow. I'm a better then podcaster, what? I guess. Actually, I'm um, good at a lot of things. I, I, I agree, um, except writing, because you won't do it. So the best <laughs> ability is availability, and if you don't want to write, you've seeded that ground. A, uh, so um, one more question about modern defense. Is there a scheme – that fits these athletes. Like everyone talks about Jim Schwartz and it's like, Oh, well of course let's put miles Garrett one-on-one with the tackle. Like that's easier said than done. Um, and I guess my question is like, is there a strategy where it's like, all right, we got all these great athletes. They know how to play modern defense. Let's let them do blank. Yeah. I think it's um, defense is less talked about, but I don't think it's any, I mean, it's, just as prevalent as offense as far as time on the field and importance to the game. 
but we talk often about building schemes around quarterbacks or building schemes mm-hmm. around offensive players. Like that's the true marvel of what uh, Shanahan has been able to do is like he has found an ability to build schemes around these unique players. And the more unique your player is and the more creative your coach is, the more difficult your scheme is to stop. So obviously all the Shanahan stuff with Debo before they went and got McCaffrey, like Debo Samuel is one of a kind player. And he's, yeah. and he's the type of player that's like a lot of coaches wouldn't have any clue what to do with him. And they're like, all right, he's not receiver enough to be receiver. He's not running back enough to be running back. So why don't we create a yeah. position? And then he's incredibly valuable. So I think that I would apply the same logic to uh, to the defensive side of the ball. Is Yeah, when you have the right players, you can play just about any style as long as your style is uh, leans on the value of the players that you have. And you can see that, like, the Eagles last year defense was great. It's very different than what the Browns are doing. And they, the Eagles, didn't have a guy, a single guy, despite despite the numbers Reddick put up. They didn't have a single guy as good as Miles Garrett. But they had waves of them. And they want to play zone in behind them with uh, older, smart, opportunistic defensive backs. It's very different from, like, the, the blitz bluff thing we were doing back in – in a very Wink Martindale style where I guess he doesn't do that much anymore, but it's like, look, high variance. We got man coverage guys and we don't have a dominant pass rusher. Let's get after the ass and dare them to, to challenge our guys in man. That was beautiful. Thank you. A couple questions before we get to badasses and statue of limitations theater and you torch all your old teammates. All right. Um, you mentioned the motion at the very beginning about uh, what the Patriots did and what Heinz Ward eventually did. Is this is motion becoming like what you said about cover two earlier, where it's like, OK, like the reason the Dolphins are successful, I'm sure motion has a lot to do with it and it does destabilize the defense. But they also have the fastest <laughs> guys on the planet. Yeah. And that probably helps, too. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to take anything away from Mike McDaniel. He's great. He's been great. The motion's great. The scheme is good, but very good. I would say that. What's most effective about this team, aside from the quarterback's accuracy, the most effective thing about this team offensively is that they were put in a bad situation where they had a quarterback, they had receivers who were really fast, and a quarterback that they can't let get touched. And the result of those constraints was they had to figure out ways to get deep down the field quick enough so that the quarterback does not get touched. I think the result of that is the offense that was created because the necessity of it being there. But I would say, aside from that, the general philosophy of this offense is keep on testing them. It's like like we have a lot of fast guys. We have a lot of guys that can go to the crib. You're going to have, we're going to put a guy in space or not even in space. He could be covered, but we're going to get the ball to this guy where he has one guy to beat as many times as possible. And you guys are not going to be able to get them down. If you notice that they have so many, I I, I haven't looked at the numbers, but I'm pretty certain that 20-yard plays, 30-yard plays, 40-yard plays, the Dolphins got the most of them. And when you watch it, it's it's rarely like them running naked where we've gotten to feel like we expect from like a Shanahan-style offense. It's them breaking a tackle or it's them outrunning an angle. And what they're doing is not like confusing people and destroying coverages and causing coverage busts as much as they're like, all right, well, we'll hand it off to a chain. And, uh, and he has one person to beat. He'll outrun the angle yep. touchdown. Oh, yep. he won't outrun the angle four times in a row, but eventually he's going to outrun the angle. We're going to throw it over a deep over to Tyreek Hill. And yeah, there's a guy covering him and a safety there. Eh, missed tackle gone to the house. So like, it's not, anything that other coaches can't create. They just keep doing it and keep testing you. And I think it's a credit to Mike McDaniel, obviously, but it's also a credit to Tua's accuracy as they catch him in stride and they challenge people. This would be a great written piece. Hey, yeah. um, let's do uh, let's do people Statue of Limitations Theater. <laughs> it's more than that. Nobody reads. There, I mean, there's like less than 100, more than 30. <laughs> Readers in America. I, I do think it's funny that like, as I was exploring different career options over the past 
six months, I would say, at no point did writing come up. Mm-mm. Not once did anybody. Yeah, when I first, I met with that was when I first every single network. When I f- first left the NBA Players Association, I started writing for fun and sending it. Well, not for fun, but sending it to places to get published. And then ESPN saw some of the writing. Was like, why don't you come write for us? And so I started writing for them. And then it got the contract time. Like, why don't you work for us? And uh, contract time. And I was like, all right. And like, this is what we pay writers. This is what we pay people who are on TV and radio. I was like, this is back when radio was a thing. I was like, hey. Sure. Mike and Mike, here I come. Let me, let me get a <laughs> let me get a guest spot, Greeny. I am not working for those writer peanuts. Anyway, you were doing uh, uh, what do you call it? Statue of Limitations Theater. Sorry. All right. Um, if you have another story you want to be teed up on, that's fine. But again, we, I do a rock bottom theater, and we had uh, Mitchell Schwartz and TJ Ward, who were both on the 2013 Browns over the past two weeks. They both had great Brown stories. But as I said earlier. You won every place you went because you're just a winner. You're a culture guy. Uh-huh. Um, that's why you're so good on TV. Um, but uh, I want to talk about those Ravens teams because I feel like every single time I hear a story about Ed Reed or Ray Lewis or, I mean, there was just like 10 of those guys on that team. It, every story seems fake to me and 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 yet they're real. Um, give me... A story that you think is emblematic of that era, okay. that team, Here we go. that culture. No problem. That's good. Um, there are lots of stories that I will not tell and I will never tell, and that's just the way it is. And, and who are most of those stories about? All right. So this is the story I'm going to tell, and okay. <laughs> <laughs> I will not tell you who those stories are about. I won't give you anything to dig on because, as wow. we mentioned, that's you are relentless and pathetic, and you will get to the bottom of that story. Desperate. And, desperate. <laughs> oh, desperate. desperate. My pathetic. bad. My bad. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. So here's an emblematic story for you. We would do, uh, you, someone who prepares endlessly, probably have already heard this story because it's a story I've told before, but we do two-minute drill in practice at the end of, I don't know, Wednesday or Thursday every week, and it's just the defense trying to stop the offense in some sort of two-minute drive situation. And one time, actually it was more than one time, I saw um, – Joe Flacco completed a, completed, completed a pass, and they ran up to get ready to spike the ball. Ed Reed creeps up to the line of scrimmage. Joe Flacco snaps it and steps back and spikes the ball. Ed Reed dives under the center's leg to try to catch the spike and hits his hand. So you would like to know something about Ed Reed being a crazy, creative, lunatic competitor This man was practicing to see if it was possible to intercept a spiked pass. So I think you want to hear something about culture. You want to hear something about uh, personality of a team and of a person. This man was an absolute maniac when it came to winning, but it didn't show in the way that he behaved. Like he would speak in a way that was civilized and act in a way that seemed like he was of reasonable mind and thought process. But he also, and like he never did that in game. It never worked, but I think it's emblematic of, he's like, man, any, I'll try anything. And it is also like emblematic of his style of play where I, I, I remember watching film on that defense before I came there. When I signed there, before I came there watching film, and I saw Ed in cover two, uh, deep half safety, intercept a slant. And why the hell would you do that? And Ed, <laughs> yeah, Ed it would be willing to try that. And so in Ed's mind, he's, yeah. he's smarter than the quarterback. So he sees, all right, quarterback two by two, quarterback under center, um, quarterback hard counts us, we're in cover two. He knows that the quarterback recognizes one of the weaknesses in cover two because the inside linebacker, the hook player, is going to be inside the slot receiver and the corner is going to be outside the the number one receiver, which means that there should be a big hole for a slant in there and the safety is going to be deep. So Ed's like, all right, I know this, so he knows this. He knows that I know this. So he thinks that I'm not going to steal this and he thinks this is the safest thing he can do. He's not even going to read it. Eh. I'll do it anyway, and I'm not going to tell anybody. I'm going to intercept it. Our defense is going to be incredibly compromised. However, it's not actually compromised because I've thought through all of this situation to the point. So, like, that's an example of Ed being Ed. I do want to fact check you. You said that Ed Reed was in uh, cover two, and cover two was invented three years ago. (laughs) 
So. <laughs> well done, sir. I just go back, go back to the tape on that one. Um, all right, we're going to do badasses. Um, and maybe the answer is Ed Reed and you can just refer back to the story. But if it's somebody else, it, the most badass person you ever played with, and it could be any level of football. It could be someone on the, uh, the damn Orange Bowl maryland oh, terrapins gosh. it doesn't it doesn't matter i was at that spurrier's last game you guys sent spurrier into retirement yeah we but he, anyway it could also be somebody in the, in the national easy. football league <laughs> um <laughs> yeah uh no, it, was that t- it was that 10-0 lead that you guys yeah, had we did we was, was it 14 10-0? points or 10 i don't remember man. it was definitely yeah. two scores yeah there was a pick six there at the beginning i remember I we got run out of the OB, it was a bad no didn't luck. it didn't it uh it was that um rex grossman didn't play the first quarter if I'm not mistaken. Let's talk about how we beat the dog out of Tennessee in the Peach Bowl the next year. Let's talk about that. Or how we how that. we blew out West Virginia in the Gator Bowl the final year. Let's talk about that, those. I, I was at that game too. Good. Pac-Man Jones on the other team. Yeah, he was. And um, I remember that. Yeah, and Chris Henry and um what was the quarterback? I can't remember. Not Pat White. I'm not oh, that God. young. Somebody else. No, no, no. Oh uh, God. Anyway. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so I met I, I, met, I, met, I met I met Chris Henry at a magic game when he was suspended. Oh, nice guy. Yeah. 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 He was not a nice guy on the field. He was one of those ferocious players, but his son, apparently awesome athlete, RIP Chris Henry. And and uh Pac-Man Jones is his uh yeah. guardian. Yep. Yeah, Great. Beautiful story. Beautiful story. They, right. uh someone tried to make a movie out of my tweet. I tweeted that and someone asked me if they could make oh, a significant person who does significant things is like, "Can we option this tweet?" And I was like, "I'm not really sure." how you want me to go about this and then they never followed up with me. <laughs> yeah, pretty, I was like I was like I'm happy to like try to figure this out. Yeah, I'm pretty but, sure you then, guys need to call Pac-Man. Oh. Yeah, I'm like I am not they were like they literally were like can we option your tweet? And I was like uh, I just took this from like a college football recruiting site. So I can't imagine. I don't I listen, I am all for getting money that I don't deserve. <laughs> I mean, that's been my whole career, but I was just kind of like, ah, I don't know about this one guys. Oh, that's going to be a real, it'll be a real they bad like, look. <laughs> literally. They were like, we'll let you know either way in 24 hours. That was a year ago. I've never heard from them again. <laughs> um, all right. Badass. I don't know. It's tough. <laughs> oh, uh, great. Great. I mean, it's just like, I, I guess defining badass is hard. It's just like, I, there's so many people I play with like Terrell Suggs, uh, Ed Reed, Ray Lewis, yeah. Al Wilson is a name that you speaking of Tennessee. It's a oh. name that you probably wouldn't um, remember, but he was the linebacker and defensive captain of of course those three years I spent in Denver, and he was animal and he was incredibly kind to us off the field, but ferocious in like a classic linebacker sense. Um, I played with John Lynch and and Champ Bailey, like also badasses. So I'm just gonna say names. How about that, Haloti Nada? Another sweetheart who is also Haloti Nada is already in this because badass. of TJ Ward two weeks ago. He said that Haloti Nada is the one guy. TJ said that no one wanted anything to do with on the field. No extracurricular stuff. It was just like, yes, sir, Mister Nada. He, we're good. He's one of those guys. He was one of the first guys that was like enormous and athletic. Yeah, that yeah. I remember like being like a precursor to like Jalen Carter type style, where it's like, oh no. They don't make him like that. He's like a, a a unique human being where he would be playing just as explosive as our tight ends, but 300 and, I don't know, 20, 30 pounds. It was impressive. So, yeah, there's – I just said a bunch of names. Is that enough for you? Good? Do you know, no, I, you know who I'm going to give badasses to? Who? Our mutual friend, Mina Kimes. Oh, yeah. She is a badass. Had a baby. That's pretty She's badass. badass. She had a baby. She's sending me – photos of her son i don't know if her, the name is public but uh uh in football yeah you can tell Both her my she, son she named, and her son uh, are wearing uh football onesies nice teddy's gonna be a football for halloween and i dressed him up in it yesterday he looks ridiculous it's amazing he's a particularly fat baby so i decided he would be a, a ball type of shape yeah i mean i think so, that there you go uh maybe i'm breaking news here amina i apologize but i think she's comfortable with people knowing her son's Name is Marshawn Lynch Sylvester. I thought you were going to say Dominique. Nah, that would have been real weird. Like, uh, it's like, not my junior. I got three kids of my own. I don't Marshawn, know. Marshawn. Marsh. <laughs> well, Speaking Marshawn of things Sylvester. that I'm good at, Marshawn. <laughs> hey, uh, Marshawn <sighs> Sylvester, we're putting into badasses. Um, hey, um, 
Have you been on in media longer than your NFL career? Probably. Yes. Yeah, I would think so. So there you go. Well, I mean, I guess it depends on how you define a career. I became a professional by your standards when I got to the NFL, but I mean, I started working towards being a professional when I was eight. So I was a professional football player when we lost to the Winston-Salem Tiny Vikings at the Super Bowl in Disney World when I was 12 years old. So that was the at that At the player. Wide World of Sports? Yeah, we were. Yeah, we you got to bring it. You yeah. got to bring it to the wide world of sports. It was tough. It was tough. We got our ass kicked by them. They were really good. Apparently, they were perennial competitors, but we got there from Randallstown, Maryland. Um, I have a couple questions before we go. Number one, you mentioned this. Like, when was there someone who came to you when you're like 12 years old and they're like, you're probably going to reach the pinnacle of the sport? No. No. Of course not. You everyone says it on your own. Everyone says the opposite. Because no, but I'm just saying, like, ob- you were obviously the best player. Like, when was the first time you were not the best player on, on a field? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, like, in high school, because of age gaps, like, I, when I was a sophomore, sure. like that. But, um, I mean, college, probably. When I got to college. Right. Yeah, that was probably the first time. But at no point were you like, this is a little weird. Shouldn't somebody be better than me? See, the thing, then- the thing is, you... You're born into it, kind of. So, like, the the when all of us were young boys, us sports fans, we probably fantasized sure. about being an NFL and thought we were, or being a professional athlete of some kind and right. thought we were going to be. So you all, when you are three, four, five, six years old, your your world is small enough that you think that's a realistic possibility. And at some point, something happens that makes you realize it's not a realistic possibility. For me, that never happened. Right. <laughs> it's like, right. it's like I was the best kid in my elementary at sports. Right. Then I got to high school and or got to middle school, and I was not the best basketball player, but I still was like amongst the best athletes. Then I get to high school, I'm the best player. Then I get to college, and like there's no there's no slap in the face moment where it's like, oh, actually, you're not that good. I mean, everyone's like, no. so it was just the absence of that moment. It was never like someone saying to you, like, hey, by the way, you should probably start preparing for like no, a, no, 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 athlete track. I always wanted to. I always thought I was on that track. Yeah, yeah. no, I know. So like, but if you, you were imagine, just waiting around it, for your dreams to be crushed and it never happened. I wasn't waiting to be crushed. It just didn't cross my mind that it could be crushed. So people would say like, you're too small or like, think of the odds, oh, yeah, yeah. think of the odds. And so like, it was always somebody saying something like that, but then I would go out and play football and I was better than everybody. So it was hard. If you, right. I'm sure you can imagine going through this similar situation where it's like, whatever it is that you think has never truly been questioned or challenged, it's hard to unthink it. So it's like a weird thing for me to, when people ask a question like that, like, I don't know, I was, I was always kind of good. Then I get to whatever. and. And I was just become a bad NFL player. I was player, just trying to get to on. Um, not a bad NFL player, an NFL player. Um, I just wanted to be on Get Up the whole time. No, something similar <laughs> happened to me where I was actually really good, and it sounds so funny, and people are gonna laugh at it. But I played ice hockey in Florida, and I was really good because I didn't. I started skating really early, right. and like hockey is one of those sports where it's like if you have there's a barrier to entry, and right. if like you can skate well. You're going to be good enough. I was also left-handed, so the bad Ooh. goalies had no idea what to do with me. And so by the time I'm like 12 or 13, and this is not some crazy fantasy because a couple of the uh, guys I ended up playing with ended up getting drafted or playing, you know, career minor leaguer type stuff. And I was I was in their ballpark. But then I went to Michigan hockey camp, University oh. of Michigan hockey oh. camp, when I was 13 years old. And I have never – like, I don't think I had like a meltdown. Yeah. But I just remember being like – like exactly what you're describing not happening. Yeah. It happened all at once. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, not only are these guys better than me, but they're significantly bigger than me. They're smarter about the game than yeah. me. They know more about the game than me, which in Florida was not happening to me because it was ice hockey. It was just like all at once. I was like, well, that's uh, that's Camp. it for me, guys. That, I'm sorry. That's a very yeah. sad story, but it puts you on your um your super villain track to become the person that you are today. Congratulations. That's your <laughs> super villain origin story. Um, <laughs> I've forgotten. Uh, I did go to Art Monk football camp, which was a full, full pad football camp. And it was divided by age. Up until that point, I only played divided by weight. And so this was divided by age. So then, and I was a running back. So then I played running back against, I guess they were 12 year olds, 12, 13 year olds who were enormous and aggressive and they grade you. I still have my like report card. They gave me the report card and it was like very like negative 
I mean, not negative, but it was like, you're, yeah, good luck. Focus on some other stuff. That was, I, I don't know. I guess it's the, um, it's the, the brain of an athlete, but I, that didn't deter me. It was like, all right, cool. Then I went to other football camps. Wait, Art, just, was Art Monk being like, this guy doesn't have it? <laughs> I mean, it was Art Monk football camp. So I took a picture with him, but he didn't grade me. They had a bunch of other coaches that were there. And it was like, yeah, this guy, this guy ain't it. Wow. That was your that was your Michael Jordan. Yeah, like didn't that. make varsity. I story. guess, but I forgot it until just now. But I um until I mentioned that Red Berenson's hockey camp was traumatic for me. Yeah, and then I started thinking about the camps that I went to. I remember going to Penn State's football camp, going to uh, who else? Uh, Maryland's football camp, like older. Once you're in high yeah, school yeah, and yeah. stuff, going to those camps and and then they treat you special when you run fast, and that's kind of weird. But yeah, Art Monk didn't that's, believe in me. That's... <laughs> That's a good place to leave it as any. The Dominique Foxworth Show is available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, the ESPN YouTube page, and where else? We can see you on Get Up. Mm, we don't need to promote that. Just promote the stuff that I'm on. I don't care about all that other stuff. Greeny gets all the money from Get Up. I, I got to get my pod numbers up so I can use this as some negotiating leverage. So, yeah, rate review. You can start writing again. Um, Ooh, no thanks. I might write again. I might, uh, like... I don't know. The sad thing is writing is so times. good for your, I mean, I can't it's speak for anybody so else. It's so great. good for your brain is I feel like Are my so takes great. were smarter and better back when yeah. I wrote more consistently, but I can't discipline myself to write for sure. something that's not going to be published. And like, I feel like I'm worse at everything else because I don't write, but oh well. I don't want to speak for the listener, but I, I do agree that your takes used to be better. Um, all right. Thank you so much for coming on. I do not, I'm not BSing you. I'm not kissing your ass. I, I actually think you are the best person at talking about football uh, on TV in the ex-player genre. All right. Thanks for that qualifier to end. No, I didn't. I, I, there, that's actually more of a, like, there are very few people. I'm like, I got to see this guy's opinion. Okay. I got to see this guy's opinion. Okay. And you're, what? Okay. No. All right. I needed that motivation. Thanks. That's when I knew it was personal. <laughs> Me and Art Monk. You and Art Monk are on my <laughs> list. Haters. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. <laughs> See you, friend.